Okay, we are back for the Thousand Worlds Book Club, and we are talking about Men of Greywater Station. I am joined by Brandon. What up, bitches? If you haven't read Men of Greywater Station, I have the link below. It's 25 pages, and it has an overwhelming number of similarities to Ice and Fire. The podcast Starship Sofa has the audio for it if you want to listen to it. It's about an hour and a half listen, so if you haven't experienced Men of Greywater Station, pause, read or listen to it, come back. It's worth it. Now, Brandon, you've read all of Ice and Fire and Thousand Worlds, right? Yeah, I've read all that shit. I fucking hate it, though. So they get all of George R. R. Martin's writings up in Burkina Faso. Let's cut the chit-chat and get into this already. Okay, fine. Men of Greywater Station is a story of men manning a research facility on an alien planet. All life on the planet is controlled by a hive-minded telepathic fungus. The children of the fungus? So our protagonist in this story is Del Vecchio, who's the leader of the scientists, and they are searching for ways to fight the Findi. The Findi is the other foe in the double war, the first being the Harangans, who we talked about last time in The Hero. So our action begins when another human spacecraft crash lands on the planet. A man named Rain wants to rescue the survivors, while a man named Sheridan thinks it's too risky to rescue them because of the fungus. Del Vecchio sides with Sheridan, and so Rain is insubordinate. He grabs a flyer and goes off to save the survivors. The men of Greywater Station then begin to get paranoid. The fungus is coming! The fungus is coming! A man named Granowitz theorizes that the children of the fungus can absorb people's memories. And in doing so, they will know the weaknesses of Greywater Station. And they will have the weaponry of the crashed spaceship to boot. And Del Vecchio has a prophetic dream of men covered in fungus. So after all the paranoid talk in the dreams, the men of Greywater Station begin to prepare for battle. Del Vecchio prepares some tree traps outside of the station, and he runs into one tree that's unusually hard and he can't get through it. While out there, the men notice that the animals of the forest are clearing a path. This clinches it for most of them. The fungus has the survivors. However, Del Vecchio has a plan. They will wait for some sign that the fungus has them, and then hit them with everything they've got. So finally the survivors make it to Greywater Station. One man comes out of the forest covered in fungus and throws a rock. And so the battle begins. The survivors and the men of Greywater Station begin to kill each other. Del Vecchio thinks his prophetic dream is coming true. However, then Del Vecchio notices that none of the soldiers have fungus on them. Rain had successfully saved everyone after all. The prophetic dream was false. The children of the fungus had tricked the men into killing each other. Del Vecchio and Sheridan are the only ones left alive. Their chance of survival, very slim. The story ends with a beautiful starry night, and then spores falling. So Brandon, we seem to have a lot of similarities to Ice and Fire in this story. What, what are you talking about? This is in space. Well, this story begins with a spaceship falling to Earth like a shooting star, and the men take it as an omen. Oh, you're thinking about that stupid comet from A Clash of Kings. Right, everyone in Westeros took the comet for some sort of omen. But in this case, the shooting star is not a shooting star, it's a spaceship. And our author does this a bunch. In the Plague Star, there's an ominous, disease-bringing star that turns out to be a spaceship. And in Night Flyers, we hear about people staring at the stars and being affected telepathically when a spacefaring alien passes their planet. So I'm just saying our author has done this three times. A celestial object is not a celestial object. I'm just wondering if you think the comet from A Clash of Kings could be something more. Oh god, you're such an asshole. You think the comet is a Vulcran from Night Flyers, don't you? Well, yeah, pretty much. Or maybe a spaceship. Stop trying to make Vulcran happen. Next thing you know, you'll be trying to start a movement. Hashtag comet is a Vulcran. Why can't you just let magic be magic? It's a magical comet. So you do think the comet is magical? Yeah, it's friggin' hatching dragons and fulfilling prophecy. But a comet is just a hunk of ice. It's magic. Garlic keeps away vampires, I don't question that. Except, what if an author specifically explained how garlic scientifically kept away vampires in one book? Wouldn't you wonder if in another book by the same author, garlic acted the same way towards vampires? Dude, let's just fucking move on. Okay, fine. So, Del Vecchio is affected greatly by these seemingly prophetic dreams. And these dreams seem to be sent by the fungus. Which leads to Del Vecchio's paranoia, which leads to the friendly fire catastrophe at the end of the story. So, Brandon, I was wondering if this affects your opinion about the role of prophecy in A Song of Ice and Fire. Should we trust prophecy? Is prophecy meant to help or hinder our characters? Of course prophecy is helping. Azora High has to be reborn and fight me. He's got to save the world and all that jazz. 
I mean, people ask me this a lot. Who do you think Azor Ahai is? In the real world, our default opinion about prophecy is that it's bullshit. And yet in fiction, we automatically assume that it's going to happen. I mean, of course, this is one, a fantasy novel, but two, it's like a Chekhov's gun. But as we talked about last time, our author has established himself as anti-war. And Men of Greywater Station is definitely another anti-war story. The whole good versus evil thing for A Song of Ice and Fire just doesn't seem likely. And the Azor Ahai legend rests on that notion. Del Vecchio's dreams are harmful and false. And in our coming stories, especially in Seven Times Never Kill Man, we get a lot more of this. Not that false prophecy is a new thing, it's the entire plot of Othello. So you don't think there's going to be a battle for the dawn? Oh, there might be, but only because characters made it that way because of the prophecy. If the Doomsday Cult on Earth stole a bunch of nuclear weapons and brought about the end of the world, I wouldn't think it was because of some sort of magical prophecy. I would think it's because people are dumbasses. Wait a minute, are you calling me a dumbass? Because I will fucking cut you. So Brandon, what did you think about that weird tree in the middle of the story? The really hard one that Del Vecchio couldn't cut through? Nothing, it was a tree. Well, I probably wouldn't have thought about this without Ice and Fire, but I thought maybe it was like a werewood and it was the mechanism that was sending a dream to Del Vecchio. Um, well... Hey guys, what are you talking about? Nothing, just some hive-minded dream-sending fungus. Cool. Um, I'll catch you guys later. So Brandon, I wanted to know what you thought about the fact that our protagonists are not very good people. What are you talking about? You don't, you don't like Del Vecchio? Well, that's the thing. I sort of like him because he's the protagonist. But he and the rest of the characters are researching ways to commit genocide on the Findi. User on American Thinks pointed out that characters like Tyrion and the protagonist from the hero aren't good people either. And yet, as human beings, we naturally side with the protagonist and dehumanize the antagonist. Once we dehumanize them, killing them becomes easier. And just as we naturally side with the protagonist, we naturally side with our nation state, or religion, or ethnicity, which makes it easy for us to dehumanize the other, or the other, or the other. I really don't get what you're talking about. Uh, the others are the protagonists. The enemy is Jon Snow. You mean Jon Snow? It's pronounced Jon Snow. Moron. So Brandon, in this story, a hive-minded alien ends up tricking mankind into killing itself. And it does so with the help of false prophecy. Does this change your opinion of the Children of the Forest? Well, anyone that's read A Dance with Dragons knows that the Children of the Forest are kind of creepy. The question is whether or not they're doing something for a greater good. Training is never easy. Bran might just be going through growing pains. Or maybe the children of the forest are just evil and want mankind to die. But George R. R. Martin is a hippie, and the nature character is never evil. Then maybe that's the twist. Or maybe you suck. So Brandon, the end of our story is a bit depressing, but also a bit ambiguous. Do you think there's any chance Del Vecchio and Sheridan survived? Do you see Ice and Fire ending this way? Maybe Davos and the Hound sitting on a pile of rubble waiting to die? Well, right now we are 0-2 for happy endings. Things are not looking good for ice and fire. Well, what's kind of weird is that it's a happy ending in a way. The most important character is actually the background character of Andrews. He's the one that's close to unlocking the secret of genocide. When he dies, genocide is averted. So in a weird way, happy ending. True, but I doubt that was the motivation of the Children of the Fungus. I agree, but there is an upside to the destruction of Greywater. So I imagine Greywater Watch is named after Greywater Station? Oh, no doubt. Both are in a swamp. And Jojen's character is all about the sending of dreams. And the fact that the Greywater Station dreams were destructive and false makes me really suspicious of the dreams of Jojen. Whatever, I never liked those characters anyway. Speaking of not liking characters, what did you think of the character of Sheridan? You mean Dr. Smith from Lost in Space? Or Baltar from Battlestar Galactica? Or Baltar from the other Battlestar Galactica? Yeah, Sheridan is definitely that asshole coward character that the protagonists for some reason tolerate. And in this case, Sheridan somehow outlives everybody. George R. R. Martin has another story called A Night at the Tarn House where the coward character ends up surviving. I can't really think of any asshole cowards in Ice and Fire. Maybe Littlefinger. So that's all for Men of Greywater Station. Next time we'll be talking about Bitter Blooms. It's a medieval story that takes place on a planet with uneven seasons. I'd like to thank Brandon for joining me. Night's King out! And we'll see you next time with Bitter Blooms. The text and audio for Bitter Blooms are below.